Hey guys, Ham Radio 2.0. This is Jason KC5HWB. And this is the Elecraft Forum given at the Texas Hamcom in June of 2017, which is the ARRL West Gulf Division Convention, and it starts right now. Today's episode of Ham Radio 2.0 is brought to you by Gifts for Hams. Find their website at www.gifts4hams.com. Get your call sign or club logo engraved on virtually anything you want. Specializing in ham radio related gift ideas, Gifts for Hams is your one stop shop for lighted call sign displays, coffee mugs, coasters, drinking glasses, smartphone cases, and so much, much more. Laser engraving and etching to show off your ham radio call sign or club. Shop gifts4hams.com and tell them that Ham Radio 2.0 sent you. Hello, everybody. This is Adam, call sign AD0AM in Dyersville, Iowa. And you are watching the Ham Radio 2.0 video podcast series. Available on live from the hamshack.tv and YouTube. Thank you, Jason. All right, so uh, I'm on 460 megahertz. Somebody wants to listen in. So uh, we thought we'd give you a little bit of a technology update, and also um, that that'll comprise the first little section. We've got a new product out. Um, but the rest of the time, we're going to talk a little bit about. For every de expedition and everybody that goes up on a mountaintop and every for all you contesters, how many contesters do I have in the room? Do I have some? Yeah, cool, awesome. DXers, same way, same way? DXing? Yep, okay. Um, for all those de expeditions, there's a vendor behind some of those. And we've learned a lot of things when you send radios out to deserted islands and run them on wonky power for a few weeks and make a few hundred thousand CUSOs. So uh, we'll share uh, that one section. We'll uh, uh, take a look at um, uh, what we've learned from that, just fairly briefly. And then I'll step through both a history of the K line and the KX line, our two current products in addition to the legacy line we just talked about. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. I've got a lot to cover. Uh, a lot to cover. Um, oh, let's turn this on. There we go. Question, first question is, who am I? And I'm not Eric and I'm not Wayne, for those of you familiar with, uh, and I'll be right up front. Um, I handle all the international distribution. Uh, as you know, for those of you who have Elecraft gear, by the way, who has Elecraft gear? Ah, oh, cool, thank you very much for coming. Um, in other parts of the world, we support directly, you can, if you live anywhere in the world, you can buy a radio or any other of our products directly from us in California. We support those guys internationally. I handle a number of distributors in Europe, particularly, primarily because of the CE regulations and things. Uh, we have distributors in other parts of the world, Japan, Brazil, um, uh, Eastern, the, some of the Eastern Bloc countries. We've got some guys who are bringing our products in for us. So I handle those, I work with those guys a lot. I've learned a heck of a lot. Being a US guy, I've learned a heck of a lot about some of the unique requirements for transmitting and licensing in various parts of the world. That's a whole story in and of itself. Uh, I also do a lot of their tech support, so I'm a, I'm a pretty heavy techie, but not uh, necessarily like our engineers. And as you can see from my picture there, which is about 10 years old, one gets to age a lot when you do this. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a very old picture. Uh, my background is, uh, uh, I've been a techie all my life. I'm one of the uh, renegades from Silicon Valley, as are, there are a number of us at Elecraft, uh, being about an hour down the road from Silicon Valley. Um, we have a, and our, by the way, at, at the factory at Elecraft, if you ever have a chance to come and visit, please do so. We have a ham club every meeting every day. We've hired most of the RF guys in both, uh, with an RF background from both uh, Santa Cruz and Monterey counties in California. Uh, we're about 60 people total. So I have a long uh, history in product sales and support. I was a field engineer for Hewlett Packard for many years as well as a salesman and uh, uh, 
have run also worldwide distribution for them as well. It's, uh, that's, so it was a very compatible fit when Eric called me about five years ago. So, so that's me. Well, let's talk a little bit about what we're up to. We'll be taking a look at the KPA 1500 and then we're going to look at the uh, D-Expeditions next. We'll take a look at the product lines. <clears throat> we used to sell just radios. We now have full-blown product lines with a lot of compatible products and I'll step through that kind of history there. So that's what we're up to. First one, our, uh, we have a new entry we announced actually at Visalia for the DX convention guys out there in California, but uh, uh, we're still expecting uh, shipments to begin somewhere in midsummer for the KPA 1500. Looks remarkably like, anybody got a KPA 500? Cool looks remarkably like a KPA 500 and the reason is is outside of the form factor which is slightly larger uh, we've taken the CAT 500 the KAT 500 and buried it in the cabinet on this guy so that's a amp with a built-in tuner so you have all the integrated tuner antenna selection controls things like that built right into the uh, to the amp itself I'm gonna get that out of the way or I'm gonna die so here we got some of the features, full legal limit. Um, we're using LDMOS devices. That seems to be one of the common questions these days. They, uh, we are doing multi-source on the LDMOS devices. Uh, there are some slight differences, but we're using ones that are each rated at output all by itself. So we're pretty well derated from uh, spec on that. Um, there is a separate cabinet, we'll see here in a minute, that uh, houses the power supply itself. That gives us a fairly small form factor for the desk, and there'll be enough cabling to let you slip that power supply right down on the floor, just above it, right down behind. There'll be about five and a half feet of cable that comes with this thing to connect the two together. Uh, like all of our products, uh, um, we use pin diodes, transmit, or what we call the TR diodes, um, for uh, fast switching. Um, very silent, uh, as uh, those of you who have the KPA 500 will be exactly the same way. Um, it's also just like our, uh, our, our, what we now call the power combo, that's the KPA and CAT 500. You can hang those guys on anybody's transceivers. It's just not use, unique to Elecraft. Same way here with the uh, KPA 1500. And um, uh, also, uh, for a lot of those we have what we call basic mode operation that's where we use a frequency counter to figure out what frequency you're on so just the first sip of RF usually about two watts both the the, uh, the KPA of 1500 will figure out what you're what you've set your VFO to and will take the appropriate actions and set itself up to do so this is very nice because this is the last arbiter of what's this guy doing because no matter what you try to tell the amp, if I say I want to go to 10 meters, but in fact you go to 15, this guy will figure out, just like the KPA and the CAT, it'll figure out what frequency you're on. And it goes 160 through 6, that's legal, full legal limit at 6 meters. So uh, uh, get, your hard, get your hard line out, you're probably going to need it up there. So here's the uh, business, what I call the business end. No one wants to look at the front of the thing. You really want to see what all this I.O. is about. So let's take a look at some of this. I won't, I won't uh, the, by the way, we have an FAQ online and I have a hard copy down at the, de at the uh, uh, booth, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here. We've got a number of I.O. Um, around the side here. We start with the USB. This is actually a virtual COM port, very common in most radios today. Uh, this allows us to run our utilities and things like that, also uh, to allow for rig control capabilities. The Ethernet port is actually being designed for remote control. We see remoting as a emerging facet. Uh, for those, anybody played with ham, r remote ham radio? Uh, you know, that's the guys, that's the four fee guys. You get to fly the big birds and all that kind of stuff from remotely. Um, that's a good example of remoting applications coming along. They need to be able to control and s literally restart a box from ground zero without having to go two or three thousand miles out there to do it. And so that's what this is going to be all about. Uh, PC data, this is actually a, an emulation line. We emulate a ICOM remote tuner, you know, the little white, for those of you guys who got an, who's got an ICOM transceiver had one. 
<clears throat> There's a little uh, amp connector on the back, a little four pin amp connector. This guy emulates a ICOM remote tuner. That means that basically you can have one cable on the ICOM to do most everything you need. That and the keying line and you're off and running. Uh, the tune function is uh, again an, a, uh, another one that's going to be for remote control. You want this thing to be able to, you'll be able to control the tuning functions, train a tuner remotely. It's going to be able to do that. This is the standard interface for our K3s and K3Ss. And then we have all the standard uh, device here, uh, key in, ALC out. By the way, we don't generally need ALC on our amps, uh, includes the KPA 500, uh, only if the transceiver requires it for whatever reason. The control, uh, this is the interface down to the power supply. We'll see the power supply next. <clears throat> um, this also includes the high voltage for the pin diodes. We have to bias those on to be able to do the transmit receive. Huge, big honking amp uh, connect, uh, uh, APP connectors for the uh, high current 50 volt supply for the LD MOS transmitter devices. There's a big ground here. We, um, we have single input, two antennas with the t antenna tuner. We'll have uh, switching for two antennas. And lastly, a TX sample. This is for the emerging, um, there's a lot of movement in the industry right now for uh, cleaning up tr and being able to monitor and adapt transmitted signals. At basically cleaning them up and improving their quality. This is our, our available uh, uh, way to do that. That's an output for the, right at the uh, output of the transmitter for feedback. Okay, so that's the business end. Oh, one last thing. We have three fans, um, and uh, as with any large amplifier, you're going to have to get rid of some heat. This is a fairly small box. So what we'll be doing is indexing the center fan up first. So as, you, as you're, let's say you're running ready and you keep cranking the power up. And uh, uh, so we'll, you'll hear the first fan kick in and then the other two index up behind it until you have, it, these get, the outer two get brought up the same level depending on the, can, on the, on the uh, level. The uh, best way we found to be able to manage that kind of airflow and still uh, mitigate the uh, typical noise and white noise fashion that does that. How big are the fans? Hmm? How big are the fans? The it's the same one on the, as the KPA 500. I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head. We can come on back, come on down. We'll pull, we'll turn. The, we've got one on the, on the uh, table. Let's turn around and take a look. It looks like an 80 up there on the screen. Yeah, is that what it is? You can see it better. I see pixels here. So. <laughs> So here's the uh, power supply, good old nice boring power supply. I just love these. Uh, we do have some indicators that tell us uh, for, there's our uh, 50 volt supply for the LD MOS devices. There's the bias supply for the uh, uh, PR, TR switching. And then there's some control signals for between the two. So that's the KPA 1500 in a nutshell. Come on down and we'll talk about the rest if you want uh, with, with the product there in front of us. Let's move on. This is the fun one for me because uh, one of the jobs five years ago when I uh, joined, one of the first jobs I was given was uh, start working with the de-expeditions. So I'm the guy that they call when they're planning the de-expeditions. And this has been a real fun experience for me. So I wanted to share a little bit with you from a history standpoint um, what Elecraft's done. And then we'll actually take a look at uh, uh, some lessons learned from our standpoint. Let's get going. First, uh, way back, our first K product, the K2. Um, I'm fortunate to have seen the K2 coming together because uh, Eric is, was in our, and, and still is in the Santa Cruz uh, ham club, as I am. And uh, so the K2, 1990, I think it was 1999, yeah? Um, first, first time one went to Antarctica. Frankly, Eric and Wayne did not know if the oscillator would work. <laughs> and cold. We did not know how cold it, it would, when it would stop oscillating. <laughs> As it turns out, it worked pretty darn well. So the next thing that happened is that Eric himself, this is Eric Schwartz, WA6HHQ, half uh, one of the two owners of uh, Elecraft. Um, he's quite the soda guy himself, although he's a QR go, a QRO guy, quite frankly. Um, here he is way up at Squaw, uh, out in Squaw Valley, Per, up pretty darn high and uh, packed up for himself. Here's his, uh, here's his K2 setup, the key and the mic and everything, and the str antenna strung out. Uh, 
Worked pretty well. He, he was getting really solid with the K, uh, K2 at that time. And then let's jump forward because that was our first ones, but we've done a number in, in between. Um, a number of K2s went to some early D expeditions as kind of a sidelight. And the guys began to discover that the K2 was a pretty darn good, even at 10 watts out, was doing pretty good as far as their Q counts. D expeditions are all about Q counts, right? If you can't get funding because you didn't get enough D, you know, you can't show a lot of results of a lot of guys that, that made the contacts, you're not going to get funding again. So D expeditions run on Q counts. It's almost like a contester, really, from that standpoint. So here's some good examples of uh, well, the, the things that started. So they started with K3s, and when we came out with the KPA 500, that guy's a pretty solid little amp in it for the guys that have them. Is that fair? Yeah. We've got a lot of them out there, and they take a lot of abuse, essentially, is what it's worked out to. Um, lately, we've uh, also started seeing our pen adapters showing up on D-Expeditions. For many years, D even though pen adapters were available, they were not being taken on D-Expeditions, pri primarily because it was extra baggage. Um, so we see some examples here, K3s, K3s, K3s all over the place. These guys, these guys, who's been on a D-Expedition here? We've got some D-Expeditioners here. Good job. Yeah, 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 these guys, it's, it's just sheer stamina how you guys keep going like that. So congratulations. So here's some more. These were the ones, now this is about the time I started getting involved. So I, I dealt with Amsterdam. The KX3 had just come out and the KXPA100 had just come out when these guys got on the boat, the Braveheart, to go out to Amsterdam. And the plan was to use the KX3 while they were on the boat, just to see what it would do. Uh, as it turns out, the KX3 worked so darn well, they, they had an extra guy, because they were rotating, they set up the KX3 and the KXPA and actually used that as part of their Q count. Now, that surprised us, because we hadn't planned for that. We hadn't thought that would be the case. Well, that darn KX3 is a pretty good receiver, as we've, as we've since found out. Who's, anybody got KX3s? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do, is that a fair statement? It's a pretty, pretty good little uh, radio. Well, this was the first time we really got some confirmation that that actually was working. So they didn't tell us until they came back that they had set up an extra station and were running them for cues. <laughs> it's going, wow, okay. So uh, Thingo is, you do get some, um, some really interesting surprises. So I will tell you, I've had one de-expedition who had no internet on the island. They had to go to a, they had to take the boat back over to another island. They, had, they lost one of their radios. Well, we get really incensed very quickly. We actually have a configuration, sort of like the, when we sent guys up in space, remember they had a full mock-up down in, down in Houston? We had the same thing. We know what their configurations look like. And uh, in one case, we actually had to f uh, um, send them new firmware. So we emailed the firmware, and they went over to the other island, got it, took it back, downloaded it. Those are the kinds of things we learned about some of our tools and, and how we develop and be able to do things like that. But that's what happens when you go into cold as well as hot. We learned a lot of things about hot. Anybody got rusty screws on their K3? There's a whole stainless steel kit. Guess where it came, guess where it was, <laughs> how it got started. <laughs> You take them out here and it doesn't take long for non-stainless steel screws to bubble up and pop real fast. We learn a lot about the joints, the, the grounding joints in our uh, case. We learn a lot about stuff like that when you start shipping off to places like this. We've had guys who've set up too close to the water's edge, get a rogue wave, literally, water's washing through the, through the tent. You can take a, we get the, we get all the rigs that go out to these guys, they all come back because they'll get a refurb on us for having been taken out. And it's really neat when you see them with salt water behind that clear plastic bezel behind the display. And you turn them upside down, these little crabs fall out and stuff. <laughs> They're dead, but you know. <laughs> yeah, so you put them in places like this and uh, that's what you get, there's uh, John K6MM. Key thing, one thing I mentioned earlier that the pan adapters have begun to show up. Anybody, uh, we've all worked the expeditions at some point, right? You know, when you're running split and you're having to do all that stuff. Have you ever noticed that 
if, you do, if you're there and you're right in the middle of the pile and the guy disappears, your target, right? He just disappears. He might be gone 10 seconds, 15, I figure he's drinking water or something. Not the case. What they're doing these days to improve their cue counts, they're watching the pileup. They can see the pileup. They not, for, you've seen it, right? There's just this wall of people coming at you, right? And, uh, and then there's some strays. Sometimes they're lids. Sometimes, you know, the, the guy pushed the wrong button. They're out there getting them. They'll jump out of the pile, go get them, and then go back and then come back in the pile. Uh, that's cool. Okay. Uh, well, that really kind of changes the whole cat and mouse game when I'm playing D Expedition Contacts, right? <laughs> so, pan adapters now on the receiving end. And in fact, here's a great one it, that, at Navasa. This is 15 meter ready. This is the, what it looks like if you're on the receiving end of a pileup at Navasa. Now, what was cool at Navasa was the first day they were there, they were in the bottom of an old lighthouse. It was 115 degrees the first day. We have a picture, while this, at the same time this was taken, of a KPA 500 running ready on this pile at 115 degree heat. And to the thing about the K2, we, we had never tested the KPA 500 at 115 degree heat and running ready. But it worked. I, I was very impressed. That's, that's uh, early on, 2014, I was really impressed with the KPA 500. I'm very pleased. So that's what it looks like. We know that this guy's running split because that's red. For those of you who have a pan adapter, one of our pan adapters, you'll know that he's running split. So just for fun, for this show, I decided to do something real cool. If you've thumbed through QST, this is our current QST ad claiming victory for all those de expeditions. But I wanted to know, well, we've got a whole long list of them here, and I'll show you what they, who they are. These were starting back, what, about 2011. This is kind of the last one on this list. I just took this list. These are the major de expeditions, not the minor one, what I call minor. That's where two guys order a set of KPA 500 kits and K3 kits, and then leave two weeks later to go on a de expedition. Guys have actually done that. Um, so those are minor de expeditions, kind of just friends and family kind of thing. Uh, so we took all of these guys, put them on a, I put them on a list, and started looking them up. So here's our, here's where they came in years, and added up the Q counts. How many Qs do we? Uh, now what's curious about this is that depending on where you go, you'll see some of these claiming different levels of Q counts. I don't know which one's actually accurate, um, but I added up, and it's somewhere. It just in the, in the major ones, in the last few years, 1.3 million cues. That's a lot of, that's a, I said, send, send radios off to, wonk, to a deserted islands, run them on wonking power with all kinds of elements to expose, and you learn a lot about how to build radios or improve them. And a lot, by the way, a number of mods that you see on our webpage for the K3, guess where they came from? how we get there. And the nice part about Allcraft is that we get to, uh, we're, a part of our policy is just to make those available as retrofit kits for anybody else who bought a K3 or a K3S. It's like the K3S features that we now offer for those guys who have K3s. Same sort of thing. Okay, so, so what the heck did we learn? <laughs> okay, that's a lot of cues. Okay, build features, this is top, 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 top. This is what's kept us in the de-expeditions. There's plenty of radios to be taken. Why do they continue to take Elecraft? Efficient de-exing and contesting. They're built for speed. Q counts, the ability to manage piles. Just managing a pile is, is really what makes the radios work while, worthwhile. Now the next one, instrument the, power, the high power stuff. And you'll see that in the KPA, you're already beginning to see the hints of it in the KPA 1500. Instrument the high power, high power stuff, we have to know what's going on in there. If we can remotely support them, we still have to know what's going on to figure out what to do about it while they're out there on the islands. Okay. 
and then use the instrumentation to protect the gear. If we're smart enough to be able to extract it and then send it off, we should also build that smarts in to, where, to what I call the safe swimming area. So for instance, on a KPA 500 today, we monitor input power, output power, reflected power, and current through the finals. If any one of those steps out of the, what we know to be the safe swimming area from our testing, except for some of the thermals, um, then we're gonna declare a fault, we're gonna record it. We have fault logs on all of our new gear these days. So the CAT 500, KPA 500, KPA 1500, all have fault logs. I can see, sometimes I can come back and my guys can analyze a CAT 500 config file and they can tell you what kind of antennas you have on your ports without you telling them first. We're that smart. So that's what I mean by use the instrumentation to protect the gear. Yep, tell the operator when they hit the limits, right? Fall, do something, step out of the way and save the gear, right? Safe, if I'm, uh, don't allow us to keep running. And then tell the operator something so they know that something has happened. Okay, and then a enabling this remote diagnostics and recovery is kind of what I just alluded to. We do this, we can do this not only for de-expeditions, we, we do this with individuals. Large contests, multi-multi clubs and places like that, because there you don't know who's operating the rig necessarily, but you know from the fault log something happened. So now, and you don't necessarily know what exactly happened. We can figure a lot of that out remotely. And you're going to see a lot more of that kind of instrumentation in our products as we continue to build out the product lines. So that's what we learned, and that's the de-expedition section. Okay. Any questions so far? Is some of that built in the k 3 Yes. It wasn't in the yes. There's, there's more. The fault logs in particular are not unique to the K. Well, the K3, K3S don't have fault logs, nor does the KX3 or the KX2. The radios themselves don't yet. We're, that's one of those things we're learning enough with the high power stuff that it's beginning to make sense. We're probably going to do that as you see that going forward. Particularly for remote. Remember I said that remote is an emerging facet of the hobby. You can argue about whether or not it's valid or not. That's a different discussion. We can have beers about that all day. The reality is it is a facet of the new and we have to build products to be able to support it. So let's take a look at the uh, kind of little bit of a quick history of the K line. How am I doing for time? Yeah, I'm doing good. Okay, so when the K3 originally came out, we came out with the Pan Adapter and then the, K, uh, the KPA and then rapidly afterwards the CAT 500. Uh, that, and then we started calling that the K line because I hated having to have to repeat all those pro products individually. And the reality is, it actually, uh, it's the, the reference, of course, is the Collins S line, right? The fully integrated transceiver that you could build out over time. Same, same concept, but brought forward to, with new technology. So that's what we call the K line today. Um, now we're starting with, what would you suggest we call the, a, a K3S, a pan adapter, a KPA 1500? If this is a K line, I'm calling this the K line squared with the 1500. Uh, called the uh, K line light? Oh, that's a good one. That's cool. So we're, we're kind of marketing wise, we're trying to throw this around. It, it takes a lot of beer. It's great. <laughs> so essentially then this, this works out the K line. If uh, I got the whole line, I guess some, I've seen some KPAs and stuff. Thank you very much. Um, it does work pretty well to get all integrated together. There's always things we can do to improve it. And uh, uh, we'll do the same thing with the KPA 1500. So on the K3S, just a quick review. Um, some of the things we did uh, over the K3, we went to a four layer uh, board down on the RF board. That's that big board in the bottom of the K3S uh, and the K3. Um, and uh, that helped lower the noise floor by about a dB and a half or so. So our MDS is already pretty good and it just got a little bit better. Um, the synthesizers I'll drill down here on in a minute. Uh, phase noise, um, for those who, um, but the low phase noise really has made a difference, um, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, we also threw in a, uh, a, a sound card chip into the unit. It seems to be a coming thing, so uh, um, reduces the amount of uh, wiring and outboard peripherals and things like that, particularly as the, a lot of the new computers don't even have line ins, line outs, you know, mic in for sound cards anymore, so we have to accommodate a diff different approach. 
And then uh, we also added what used to be a bolt-on preamp. We put that down onto the KXV3 board and allowed, and then imp fully implemented it in terms of stepping, uh, stepped attenuate, the step preamp. There's a stepped attenuator that's actually built into the uh, uh, new RF board. That's why you can't make a K3 into a full-blown K3S. There are always going to be some unique features of the K3S, like this PCB and the attenuator, that will always be unique to the K3S, not the K3. You don't have a retrofit kit for that. Okay, so what's all this about phase noise? So, uh, for those who understand what phase noise is now, I just need to kind of get a better sense of, okay, just a few, okay. All right, so for those who, you know, this, you hear the, ner the, the term banded around, let me see if I can tell a quick story and kind of give you an analogy. Who remembers Peanuts, the cartoon strip, and the, uh, the you know, I grew up with the, with the uh, Christmas, uh, you know, Peanuts and all that. Remember uh, Pigpen? Remember the kid that ran around and had this dust cloud all around him all the time? Okay. Well, phase noise is like that dust cloud. Except when I can lower phase noise, that means the dust cloud went from pretty much around my shoulders down to about my knees. That gives you some sense of what did this, what happened and the reason for the fa lower phase noise is we completely redesigned our synthesizers. So the, the presentation just ahead of this one was all about synthesizers. Synthesizers have, um, when, and the synthesizers are things we're changing when, we, when you spin the VFO knob these days. And the phase noise is an artifact of that generation. By lowering that phase noise though, that gives us a couple of things that happen. First off, I can get closer on the same band, I can get two K3, K3Ss closer together and you'll never know each other's there until you stand on top of each other. For field day, that's really cool. Or anybody that's running multis or those kinds of applications, that really gets interesting very quickly. The other thing that uh, the phase no the uh, uh, synthesizer gave us was the ability to run split faster. On the, for the high speed C CW ops guys, this is really important. Uh, if they're running split, when you s jump back and forth, we were having to wait a few, millis a few microseconds for the synthesizer to resettle before you could actually start transmitting. So when you're s flipping, every time you flip for on, a, on a split, if it was split across a certain boundaries, it took extra time. And it limited the speed at which you could actually send. We can now, we've actually tested a K3S and a KPA 500 at 100 words a minute in split. So it's really improved a lot. The last thing that the synthesizers gave us was the ability to support the 630 meter band. We're one of the first to be able to do that. Now right now we can only run about a hundred milliwatts and you have to have an experimental license to do it, but we're expecting that band to be fully expected. It's kind of a, seems to be a bit of a, a uh, foregone conclusion, but I'm not sure yet. Bottom line is you can still do it. We've got some guys running JT65 with 100 milliwatts out. 100 milliwatts out, for anybody who's got a K3, that's the transverter output. You can actually transmit with that guy. JT65, get out there on 630 meters, if you have enough wire. Okay. So here's our, here's our uh, what happened. This was the original synthesizer. This is our latest one so for the techie stuff there. We actually did get it to lower it. Um, so just a few confirmations on this. Uh, these, the, here's right out of the QST. We are actually one of the first. QST has never actually, until the KSEN 3A, they actually reviewed, re-reviewed the K3 with the KSEN 3A as an upgrade. Uh, you may have seen the, uh, the actual article, but this is some of the output. Uh, there's some of the heavy techie stuff, but this is really nice to be able to see. Improved uh, dynamic range and remute, uh, re reduced transmit uh, Spurious. That's the, those are the kinds of things that low f the uh, low phase noise gave us. And then the K3S came along, and we got some nice. Uh, we got even nicer stuff about it. We're uh, fortunate to really be um, ranked very highly on Rob Sherwood's receiver rankings. That's one of the reasons the DX petitions like to take them, because you can manage pileups with that stuff. So that's the K line. Let's take a look at the quick uh, on the uh, KX line. Um, 
KX line, same, same idea, bunch of products flying in close formations that fully integrated once you wire them all up. And we've got lots of nice things. By the way, one uh, interesting thing, the uh, KX3, um, the display is exactly the same chip as your K3 and K3S. It's the same display, exactly the same unit. It helps us leverage pro product, but it also means that you get a full-blown display out of a QRP rig, which most QRP rigs usually have some sort of abbreviated system. Uh, because they, uh, but in our case, we've kept the same size as same height on the uh, KX2 when we get there. So, a little bit of history. The KX1 um, was our first, by the way, X stands for extreme. So, we have the K line, we have the KX line. K, the X is for portable and uh, primarily portable and uh, soda, uh, mobile kind of application. So, that's where the X comes from. Uh, for us, ha have to live it every day. Keeping track of K and KX really gets kind of crazy making up. Um, <clears throat> so, the KX3 came out um, 2011 or so. Uh, our production space doubled. <laughs> and then last year, we came out with the KX2. It kind of surprised a lot of folks. Everybody was waiting for the, the, the uh, proverbial K4, and then we came out with this guy. Well, we, when we came out with this and announced it at Dayton last year, not yet this year, but last calendar year, <clears throat> um, we fully expected this guy to cannibalize some of the sales on this guy. We, in fact, told our suppliers, our board uh, um, pick and place folks and the um, sheet metal guys, uh, back off on that a little bit. We're going to this KX2. Well, something strange happened when we introduced this. The KX3 numbers kept going up, as well as the KX2. What the heck is happening? For those of you who have a KX3, um, Hopefully you'll confirm this, but we've since discovered <clears throat> that a lot of KX3s are being used at home in the home shack. And that accounts for why they, the sales didn't go down, because they're not all being used for mobile. And so we now have a positioning with our K-line where this, for guys who are living in small uh, in apartments, condos, don't have a lot of room for, you know, the man cave. Um, this has turned out to be a real nice setup. They can tuck this away under somewhere, don't need it right out in front of you. This sits on the desk and, or whatever, or even in your lap or, or out in the back of the pickup truck even if you need to. And so the versatility of it has actually proven to be one of the best things for those kinds of operators that don't have the big shacks and the big towers. Just like the Braveheart and the Amsterdam guys were telling us, they actually were telling us early and we didn't even realize it. That, yeah, this is a pretty good setup and it works. So the KX2 came along and now we've gotten to what, yeah, I said the X is for extreme. Now we've got extreme extreme. So we had one guy down in Antarctica with a K2 and he had Eric up there on soda. We have a lot of soda guys, um, IOTA guys, soda guys, swamps on the air, islands on the air kind of things. Uh, that where this really works well, the, the backpacking crowd, literally, we get calls saying, how many ounces does the, f does the mic weigh? How many ounces does that little paddle weigh? They are calculating how much load they have to call, they have to haul. They are really just absolutely obsessed with it. So that, that means there's really, really extreme, oh, yeah, let me do this. We did a little size comparison. The KX2, by the way, is half the cabinet space of a KX3 half the physical cubicle cabinet space. So the KX3, we had to give up a few things. We had to give up a number of buttons to get to the KX2. And we, since the KX2 was smaller, we actually had designed the KXPD3 kind of as a designed specifically so that when it sits on the desk up, we had all these really finely designed aspects of the physical layout of the KXPD3. Turns out you can take a KXPD3 and mount it here, but we redesigned it primarily because the form factor does dictated it. And that, not only that, Wayne had just discovered 3D printing. Every one of these housings here are made on a 3D printer. <laughs> so um, we've had, what was neat about, by the way, what was neat about the uh, 3D printing was that Wayne in the morning could redesign this send it off, the guys were right down the street there in Redwood City, 
afternoon, he's got a prototype. Whereas on the KXPD2, we had to send it off, wait a week or two, get it back. No, he didn't mill this right and send it back. He's turning these things in hours. And that really sped up the design of, uh, of the uh, whole paddle. Um, we had to dink around a lot with these holes and things like that. I was involved with some of that. It's, uh, dinking, by the way, is a technical term. Okay, just a technical term. So kind of getting back to our original roots with the original KX-1, the original Extreme. By the way, for those who are not familiar, this was two or four bands, CW only, no foam. This, on the other hand, is uh, 80 through 10, all modes except FM, so it includes AM. You can actually do a wideband AM on this thing. And uh, 10 watts out, this was, if you pushed it hard, you might get almost four. <laughs> so, a little bit more out. Uh, this was the original paddle design, um, very simple. It actually withstood the test of time pretty well. Unfortunately, the KX-1 was, um, as we were talking, for those of you who came in a little bit late, um, the KX-1 was uh, taken out of the product line primarily because some of the parts could not be replicated. They went to surface mount and they would not work the way we have the KX-1. So we had to let the sheet metal and, and you know, all that. We bought spares. For those of you who may have one, we do have spares. Uh, we do have some, back, uh, some sheet metal as well if it's still available. So if you scar it up, you can re retrofit it. Okay, so with the portable stuff though, we started now seeing the other kind of de-expedition which are the guys going up on the mountain. So we'll take a look at some of these guys. So this uh, gentleman here is Steve. He's WG0AT, better known as the Goat Man. If you have not seen his videos on YouTube, they are, he is very, very entertaining. I highly encourage, I can't say enough tonight, he's a great guy too, uh, but he really has pushed the, uh, the limits. Here we are, he was actually on the cover. He does have goats that he takes with him. They're his pack animals. That's his, hence the name. The other guy that I met last year in Friedrichshafen, uh, and I can't even say his last name correctly, but Emil is really, really cool. This is KX2, this is Extreme Squared. So this guy gave a talk on summits on the air last year at Friedrichshafen, which is roughly our, their equivalent of Dayton for the uh, European crowd, except he climbed to the top of the uh, area. His, um, he was out in the kind of like the hall where we are, where all the vendors are today. He climbed to the top and delivered his presentation from a sling up there. The guy is really buff, as you'll see. Um, he's, he is serious. But he's taken ham radio soda to the next level, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> we, are, we are actually sponsoring him to see how far we can go with him. And I think he's probably going to outrun us. One of the things we discovered is those displays that I just talked about, um, if you get cold enough, those things slow down. You cannot sit and run a lot of cues fast up there because the LCD starts slowing down when you get close to zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Okay. He's the one that told us about it. <laughs> so I'm not going to spend, if you want to talk about some of the features and stuff, I'm, I'm right on time though. Um, as you can see, rapid deployment. By the way, one of the things we're, we're discovering, the KX2s and 3s are also really popular for INVIS, and we've had a number of government agencies. So for instance, when Sandy hit up there in uh, Long Island, you remember, tore up the place pretty badly, that hurricane that got uh, New York, there was a FEMA guy who had just bought a KX-3 and a buddy pole stationed out there. He was not there for, the, for that. He was, in an, he was facing this stuff in a, a concrete hotel, and he was one of the few FEMA guys that could, were getting messages out via FL Digi. <laughs> and he said uh, his buddy pole, he had tied it down out there in the, uh, in the yard at the um, hot uh, hotel that went out to the beach. And he said all of his ropes except one, that buddy pole was just flapping, but it was still able to transmit. So I was, I was really impressed. 
Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the KX2. Come on down to the booth. I don't want to spend a, make this a lot of time. One of the things I did want to talk, uh, speak to is how does Ellacraft design this stuff? If you come to Ellacraft, you're not going to see a lot of engineering offices. And that's because most of the engineers work virtually. Our, our clouds, all the tools now have moved to the cloud for engineering. And so we have guys from all the way in the Puget Sound up there outside of Seattle, all the way down to Tucson, Arizona. Fortunately, we're all in the same time zone, so when we have conference calls, it works pretty well. But one of the things where some of the tools we're using, this is actually one of the mock-ups of the KX2 as Wayne was working on it with the other guys, and we're using 3D tools to be able to walk through. You can actually dive, for any of those who have had, used some of the latest CAD tools, you can dive through here and walk into the boards and actually see the heights and placements of things. This is one of the ways we're getting all of this stuff stuffed into a smaller box. Likewise, the 3D printing gave us quick turns for some of the products. We're gonna see some more of this coming from us as well. This worked really well to get this brought up. It was actually, this was actually from concept to an actual product ready to be put into production, and, you know, what we call ECO. That's when we release it in for production and start making them. That was about three weeks. Not months, not months like this thing. Three weeks, it's pretty cool. That means our time to market improves. Okay, so that's kind of the <clears throat> wrap up for, uh, for me. So we've seen, we took a quick look at the 1500. We learned a little bit about the, <laughs> how many cues that we've managed to live through without uh, major debacles. It, I bite my nails every time a new de-expedition goes out, right? That, with our gear on it, I want it to work. I've worked with the guys in planning, but at the end of the day, they're getting on, getting on the boat and going and doing the heavy lifting. And I bite my nails, but I keep, I keep up with exactly what's going on all the time. And we learned a little bit about some of how these K lines, these product families have come together. So with that, uh, questions? Yeah, There's our